We're in a series that I started two weeks ago now that I'm calling Say What? And really what we're doing is we're looking at this whole idea of hearing from God. The first week of this series, I gave you six more common ways that God still speaks today. Last week, we did talk about positioning ourselves. How can we position ourselves to be in the best possible place in order to hear from God? And this week, we're continuing the series. This week, we're kind of going to be doing a litmus test. Did I really hear from God? Is what I'm hearing actually from God, which I think is real important because there are other things trying to get our attention. There are other things vying for us to pay attention to them, sometimes not necessarily good, all the while that God's trying to get us to hear him at the same time. So that's what we're going to be looking at as we walk through it this week. Now, I'll tell you, I kind of want to prime the, the group for next week. We're going to be wrapping up the series next week by asking what I think is a very important question. And that is simply this, what do you do when you know you've heard from God? What do you do? What is the action step that you and I should be taking once we're convinced that we've heard from God? So we're going to be wrapping the series by talking about that next week. If you missed any of the sermons that are in this series, I would encourage you to go to our website, which is mythrive.church, and go forward slash media. And when you do that, all of my sermons will pop up, and you can watch and listen to any of the sermons that you might have missed. This morning, what we're going to be doing is talking about figuring out how to know if, in fact, it is God that we're hearing. Now, you know, how do you know that thought that keeps popping in your head, that impression you've had, that whatever it is you've heard actually came from God. And, and it, here's the deal. If you're going to make your life choices based on hearing from God, then it's a good idea to be sure that you're really hearing from him, right? <clears throat> it's important. Uh, how do you move forward? How do you move forward with confidence that God is actually speaking to you? Before we get started, how many of you brought your Bibles? If you brought them, hold them up. Old school's got pages, new school's got screens. If you're new around here, we use something called the YouVersion app. Um, Cindy alluded to it when she was talking about uh, reading through the Bible in a year. There's so many wonderful resources in that app. I can't even begin to tell you how many actual translations of the Bible there are on their app, but there's a ton of them. They it does have the through the Bible. But the cool thing is that if you have the app, you can open it up and go to events, and all of my notes for this morning's sermon will be right there on your smart device. I think that is so cool. we got a lot of ground I want to cover this morning, and I realized in first service I didn't cover it well because it was like almost time for second service, and we were just getting out from first service. So, But we don't have anything to worry about this time, do we? <laughs> There's no football game. The race at Talladega doesn't start till 3.30. Life is good. We're good. Okay. How do you know if what you're hearing is God or not? Well, first thing I want to do is talk about the fact that most of us receive our information from three separate, different, distinct sources. And I want to share them with you to kind of get started. Three sources of the ideas, impression, thoughts, or whatever it is we get, where we get them from. The first one to me is a no-brainer. It comes from you comes from yourself <clears throat> I mean there's a ton of stuff I don't know about you there's a ton of stuff that bounces in and out of my head every single day you know and, and when I lay down at night to go to sleep the moment I put my pillow my head on the pillow it's like there's this switch in my brain that gets turned on and I think about some of the weirdest stuff in the world you know, I mean, I think about things like, well, can a cassowary actually eat a man? Yes. And the answer is yes, you know. And then I think about things like, what it would be like if a unicorn rode a unicycle? It would be unique, right? So all this stuff goes through my head. I can't shut my brain off. Um, and so there's stuff that just pops up. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there's a way that appears to be right, 
but in the end it leads to death. Well, I'm not saying every thought you ever have is going to lead to death, but if you saw my thoughts, you would think that's what the outcome is because I have some really strange thoughts. I get a thought, and I get excited that maybe God's talking to me, but then I get another thought, and I realize how dumb the first thought was, and then I get discouraged because I convinced myself it wasn't God that was talking to me in the first place. Y'all, anybody else have those issues? I mean, I do, I do. So the number one source of where we get stuff is ourselves, okay? The second source for ideas and impressions that we get, well, this is the one I want to get us into, and that is they come from God, okay? They actually come from God. Job 33, 14 says, for God does speak. Now one way, now another, though no one perceives it. This is what we've been addressing in this whole series. How can we know that what we're hearing actually comes from God? Now, that's all I'm going to say about that because I want to jump on to the third one. Here's what I want us to be weary about. Here's what I want us to be thinking about. Here's one I want us to be on guard about. We also can get ideas and impressions from Satan. And a lot of times he will disguise himself as God. But remember, Satan is evil. Satan is the father of lies. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the believers. And, and let's be honest, there's been a lot of things done in our lifetime that, that were done, they said, in the name of God. And if we're honest, God had nothing to do with it at all. So if God had nothing to do with it, where did it come from? It came from Satan. There's no other way around it. We hear things that, that Satan speaks, and he's trying to convince us that what we're really hearing is God speaking. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 says, And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So, you see, it is vital for us to check out and to make sure that when we hear something, what we're really hearing is actually from God before we go about putting our faith into it, before we jump into whatever it was. Now, listen, as we walk through this, this is just not an academic exercise that I'm walking us through. I really want us to get this. It is so important because I believe it can be life-changing for all of us. Fact is, we get all kinds of thoughts. We get all kinds of ideas. We get all kinds of impressions. We hear a bunch of stuff, but it can be hard to figure out the source of what we're hearing. And the truth is, you can hear from God one moment, and literally the next freaking moment, you're hearing from Satan. In fact, the Bible says that happens all the time. Here's a great example of it. This is not in your outline. It is not on the PowerPoint. So folks in the booth, don't freak out. But in Matthew 16, and you know what I'm going to tell you, don't believe me. You go home and look it up for yourself or use that version app and follow along with me as I read it. Matthew 16, verses 15 through 17, this is a situation with, with Jesus and Peter. And it says, and then he asked them, that's Jesus, and then he asked them, who do you think I am? Simon Peter answered, the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. God has blessed you, Simon, son of Jonah, Jesus said, for my father in heaven has personally revealed this to you. This is not from any human source. Literally, the next moment, the next moment, here's what happens, Matthew 16, 22 and 23. Peter took him aside. Heaven forbid, sir, he said, this is not going to happen to you. Jesus turned on Peter and said, get away from me, you Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are thinking merely from a human point of view and not from God's. You understand, one moment he's saying, God revealed this to you. You are so blessed, Peter, and you're such a dog the next moment, right? I mean, Peter spoke from God one moment and then spoke from Satan the next moment. So if it can happen to Peter, it can happen to any of us, right? In fact, John witnessed this exchange with Peter and, and Jesus, and he wrote about it later in 1 John. Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear loved, dearly loved friends, don't always believe anything you hear just because someone says it's a message from God. 
test it first to see if it is it really is for there are many false teachers around so you read that how do you know if you're hearing from god how do you know well thankfully there are some tests there are some litmus tests that you and i can use there are some questions we can ask if you will, there are some filters that we can apply to determine whether or not what we're hearing from is God. And if the idea, if the thought, if the impression, if the whatever it is doesn't pass these tests, it ain't from God. Say it with me. It ain't from God. One more time. It ain't from God. Now I'll do it with some enthusiasm. It ain't from God. Okay, I wanted to call my sermon that, and Dawn said no, and I, I figured it was from God, so I didn't do that. And she said, besides, all those people who actually understand and use good English would be upset with you. I don't understand it, nor do I use it, so I don't care. But anyway, anyway, if, if you have an idea that you think is from God, and it doesn't pass all these tests, it ain't from God, okay? I'm going to say that a lot. So if it does bother you that I don't use good English, get over it, okay? Okay? Okay, all right, okay. Now listen, before I go any further, in the spirit of transparency, I got to say I didn't come up with this stuff, okay? I, I got to be honest. I got I to gotta say that my mentor, Pastor Jim, came up with this, and if you've been in, under Jim's teaching any time at all, you've probably heard this before, so it's not going to be new to you. If you weren't under Dr. Wall's teaching, then it might be new to you. But either way, it is so important. This is so, so important. And I can tell you from experience, I have used what we're going to talk about numerous times, and it works. If you want to be sure you've heard from God, pay close attention to what we talk about from this point on forward. But um, uh, we're going to be looking at what we call the seven filters. Now, here's what I need to say, and i got to say it, and I'll say it, and I'll say it, and I'll say it. Because a thought you have or an idea you have passes two of those seven filters, it's not from God. If it passes three of the seven, it ain't from God. If it passes six of the seven, it still ain't from God. In order for something to be from God, it has to pass all seven of these filters without a doubt. But if it does, you can rest assured that what you're hearing did in fact come from God. I know that sounds like an amazing guarantee. It is. Trust me. So I want to get into that. I want to look into that. But I will also tell you that even if it does pass all seven filters, there's an element of faith involved. Because if it passes all seven filters, you still got to step out if God's telling you to step out. You got to get on the water if God's telling you to get on the water. So even if it passes all seven, you still have to exercise faith in order to do what it is that God's calling you to do. So in your outline, let's look at them, the seven filters. I'm going to walk through them and try to explain each one to you. The first filter is simply this. Does it agree with the Bible? Does it agree with God's word? Listen to me. God will never, ever, 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 stop me when you get tired, ever contradict his word. Never. OK, um, what God has said in his word, that's the final authority. Luke chapter 21, verse 33 says heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. In fact, the apostle Paul, uh, he said it in his in his letter to the church in Galatians, Galatians chapter one, verse eight. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And I got to tell you, most of the cults that are real freaky and do real freaky things start off just like this. It, the, the leader will say, an angel spoke to me and he gave me new instructions in addition to God's word. You better run away. You better run away. Or if they say something like, I got some extra information. 
that's just as good as the Bible run away, okay? Um, I mean, let me give you some examples. If, if the Bible says that adultery is a sin, okay? But if you think, hey, it feels good and it's exciting and it's, it's, it's scary all at the same time, God didn't tell you to do it. It ain't from God. It, the Bible says that family's a priority. But if you say God's telling you to take, to take a job that's going to take you away from your family 11 out of the 12 months a year, that ain't from God. He's not going to do that. If the Bible says we should be people of integrity, but you get the idea it's okay to lie, it ain't from God. Okay? Understand the vast majority of what God wants us to know and of what God's going to say to us is already written in his word. God's will is found in God's word. That's why I stress that we should be in God's word. That's why I say I want Thrive Church to be known as a church who studies God's word. I think it's so important that we're reading this word, that we're studying this word, that we're going to church and listening to his word, that we're joining a Thrive group where we even delve deeper into God's word to study it and to know God's word. Why do I say that? Because we move fast. This world moves fast. Decisions are made at, at the at the at the split second kinds of things. There ain't a whole lot of time to do a whole lot of research, and you certainly ain't got time to phone a friend. So if you don't know what God's word says, you become prey for Satan. So the truth is, the better you know God's word, the easier it is for God to speak to you in the first place. So the first filter is does what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm hearing, does it agree with the Bible? The second filter is does it make me more like Jesus? Does it make me more like Jesus? Does this thing I'm hearing about, does this place I'm supposed to go, does this idea or thought that I have, does it move me more in the direction to becoming more like Jesus, or does it move me away from Jesus? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. You see, the Bible's clear. Jesus is the standard by which we should evaluate everything in our life. He is the standard. The Bible says he's the cornerstone. So if you've got an idea, if I've got an idea, if I've got a thought, if I've got an impression, if I think I've heard from God, and what I'm hearing moves me away from being more like Jesus, it ain't from God, okay? God's goal for you, God's goal for me, God's goal for all of us is for us to become more and more like Jesus. And any idea that's coming from God will move us towards that goal, okay? James chapter 3, verses 14 through 17 says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So based on that scripture, if I've got an idea and it comes from a place of envy or it comes from a place of, of selfishness, it ain't from God. If I've got an idea, but quite honestly, it's pretty arrogant and self-serving, it ain't from God. So based on this passage, if an idea is peace-loving, and it promotes harmony, and it builds relationships, it could be from God. If the idea is considerate and loving, it could be from God. If the idea is humble and teachable and full of mercy, it could be from God. If it speaks truth in love and it builds up the body, it could be from God. I say that it could be 
because if you forgot, I told you it has to pass all seven filters to be from God. Let's move on to the next one. Number three, does my church family confirm it? See, one of the ways we know if an idea comes from God is to ask other believers, to ask the church what they think of it. And here's the deal. Listen to me. It, 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 if the church thinks that's the stupidest thing they ever heard, or if you feel uncomfortable taking it to the body, it probably ain't from God. It probably ain't from God. It's probably coming directly from Satan because one of the things Satan wants to do is separate you from God and God's people. So that's a real important thing. It means it's a good idea that that, that idea didn't come from God at all, but it came from Satan. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 says, His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be known. That verse tells me that God speaks to the church through the church. Does that make sense? God speaks to the church through the church. God uses the body of Christ, people like you and people like me. He doesn't use just individuals. And so that's another reason for us to get involved in a group right here at Thrive Church. The reason I say that is you can bounce the ideas you have, the thoughts you have, the impressions you have, the things you think you might have heard from God. You can bounce those ideas off fellow believers in a safe environment within group. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 22 says, plans fail for a lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Listen. If, if you get an idea and not one other believer confirms it, it ain't from God. Got it? See, that, that in itself is a safety valve that, that God has given you and me. And honestly, if we talk about our plans with other believers, with the body of Christ, honestly, it'll help us avoid a lot of pain down the road. So, so far... The filters are, does it agree with God's word? Will it make me more like Jesus? And do other believers confirm it? Those are three possible, possible reasons or three possible ways to know that we've heard from God. But it has to pass all seven filters or it ain't from God. Number four, is it consistent with how God made me? Now, uh, around here, I teach a class. I've done it several times since the church has been, been together, I, I teach a class called Niche, where we look at how God created you, the fact that God made each one of us unique and complex and different from everybody else. There's no doppelganger of you anywhere in the world. That's a lie of Satan to diminish the glory of God. You are unique, totally unique. And as such, God has made each one of us on purpose for a purpose. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are all God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you have an idea, if you have a thought, if you think you've heard from God, and that idea, thought, or whatever it was you heard, pulls you away from the way God created you, it ain't from God. It's not from God. Even before you and I were born, God had a plan for us. It's a unique plan for each one of us. And he had a niche in mind for you. Now, of course, we have free will. So we get to choose whether or not we accomplish that. We get to choose whether or not uh, we do that at all, whether we follow that plan or go off on our own. But I can tell you he's laid out a plan on purpose, for purpose, for you. But listen, the more closely you follow God's plan for your life, the more fulfilled your life's going to be. And that's a fact. It's plain and simple. See, the secret is to discover what God needs you to do and just go do it. You'll be happy. Let me give you some ideas. You know, if, if God has given you the gift of music and you're not up here, serving with our, our, our worship team, why aren't you? Why aren't you? 
If God has given you the gift of hospitality, you just love entertaining guests, and you're not serving on our hospitality team, why not? Why not? God's created you for that. But now, it works the opposite way, too. If you get this thought or this idea that you should be working with Pastor Cat and Travis with our teens, but you hate hip-hop music, you can't stand spontaneity, you hate chaos, and you hate unbridled enthusiasm, you didn't hear from God. Okay? There's a myth out there that for whatever reason, God's will is hard to follow. And that if you're following God's will, you're giving up something. I have people say to me, I've had them say it to me several times, they thank me for sacrificing to be a pastor. I don't, and I, I don't know how to respond to that because it's what God created me to do. And when I'm doing it, I'm happy. When I'm standing here in front of you, I feel fulfilled. If you're good at something and you enjoy doing it, more than likely God created you to do it in the first place. And so when you do it, there's this sense of fulfillment that nothing else brings you. Romans 12, 6 says, God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. Now, granted, I only gave you part of that verse, and those of you that know that verse knows that it goes on, and Paul says, if, you, if your gift is teaching, you ought to be teaching. He says, if your gift is leading, you ought to be leading. God will not lead you away from your gifting. Hear me say that again. God will not lead you away from your gifting. He will lead you towards it. So if the idea, the thought, whatever it is that you got, leads you away from the way he gifted you, it ain't from God. If God were to lead me away from being the senior pastor at Thrive Church because I'm convinced God's called me to be the next IT guru, it ain't from God. Trust me. Pastor John will tell you, I struggle to figure out how to turn my laptop on. Okay? So God's not going to lead you somewhere that takes you out of your gifting. I heard a story that's true about Billy Graham where, you know, everybody knows who Billy was and how amazing his ministry was. But I don't know if you if all know this or not. He literally was the Christian advisor to seven U.S. presidents. In fact, one of them was so impressed with Billy Graham that he offered him a position on his cabinet. Billy turned it down, saying that God called him to be a pastor, not a politician. Now, for other people, God may have called you to be a politician. If God's called you to be one, you better go do it, right? But for Billy, God called him to be a preacher. The bottom line is if you get an idea that's contrary to the way that God made you, say it with me. It ain't from God. All right, number five. This is a biggie. Do I have authority in this area? Man, this is a biggie. I'm going to tell you why. I see a lot of people trying to take authority in areas they have no what should not be in whatsoever at all. I, I want to make sure that you really get this one. This gets abused in church a lot because, you know, the trump card is God told me. God told me. I mean, you can't argue with that, right? But it's, it's amazing to me how often believers, people who say they're followers of Jesus, get ideas, and they say, I've heard from God, but the idea they got that they supposedly heard from God does not involve them or their area of ministry. It involves other people and another area of ministry. God told me that the children's ministry starting next week should make our kids do jumping jacks for 45 minutes so that when we get them back after church, they're not wild. How many parents say amen? It ain't from God, okay? Or God told me that the music ministry at Thrive Church needs to be bluegrass and country. 
it ain't from God, okay? The truth is, whatever the children's ministry does or the worship ministry does, it's none of your stinking business. Whoa, Pastor Steve, I'm going to say it again. It ain't none of your stinking business. You know that's scriptural. No, I wouldn't have said it. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. Peter and Jesus again, okay? In John chapter 21, Peter looked at this dude, and he wanted to know what Jesus thought about this guy. And so look what it says here. It says, when Peter saw him behind them, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to live until I come back, that's none of your business. You follow me. So a story spread among the followers that this one would not die. But Jesus did not say he wouldn't die. He only said that if I want him to live until I come back, that's not your business. So what happened here? Peter got this idea stuck in his head about this dude, right? And he actually started talking about it. Come to find out this false rumor happened, and it started among Jesus' followers, his closest followers. And if you keep on reading, Jesus had to end up rebuking Peter about it. So one of the things you got to do when somebody gets an idea that applies to somebody else or somebody else's ministry is you need to stop and ask yourself a couple of questions. What implications are there for me in getting involved in this in the first place? Is there something that I actually have the right to speak into in the first place? Do I have any authority whatsoever in this area? Now, I'm not saying you don't share things that you believe God has given you for other people. In fact, that's one of the ways the first week, that's one of the ways I told you that God speaks today. But what I am saying is test your thoughts and your ideas first. Ask yourself, why do I feel the need to speak this? Is this my business? How do you know if an idea is from God? It has to pass all seven filters. Did I say all? Oh, okay. So does it agree with the Bible? Will it make me more like Jesus? Does my church family uh, confirm it? Um, is it the way that God made me in the first place? And then do I have authority? Do I have authority? Understand something. If you have authority, you also have the responsibility just saying okay let's go on number six number six is it convicting rather than condemning now i, I, I want you to follow me i want to i want to show you something i want to tie three verses together be careful doing this because you can get stuff all out of context but i want to look at three different verses first one is john 16 8 it says when he the holy spirit comes he will convict the world of its sin. So what's the Holy Spirit's job according to this verse? Convict the world of sin. Okay, hold that thought, right? 1 John 1, 9 says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. So there's a partnership between those two verses, right? The Holy Spirit convicts you and me of sin that's in our lives. And then our response to that conviction is confession of those sins. And then God's response is forgiveness. So Holy Spirit convicts, we, con we confess, and God forgives. And then, then, and only then, can we look at Romans chapter 8, verse 1, where it says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. How much condemnation will we have? None. None. Does that mean we'll never be convicted of sin again? No, because no, we're going to, right? But there's a major difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction is hearing a specific thing I did, 
or I didn't do or a place I went or didn't go to. And then there's a solution to that. That solution is confession. Condemnation, on the other hand, puts me down. It makes me feel worthless. It makes me feel I'm never going to get past this. And there's no solution. There's no way to fix it at all. Listen, God has absolutely nothing to do with condemnation. If you sense condemnation, if you feel condemnation, it ain't from God. And if it ain't from God, where is it coming from? Satan, okay? God made us. We are his masterpieces. And as such, we're more valuable than the most valuable piece of art on the planet. So therefore, if that's how God feels about us, we're not worthless. We're not nothing. God made us. He loves us. And he sees our value. He sees our value and operated from that perspective when he sent Jesus to die for us. He gave his only son for us. That's how valuable we are. So when you feel worthless, it ain't from God. Okay. Does it agree with the Bible? Does it make me more like Jesus? Is it confirmed by my church family? Is it consistent with the way that God made me? Do I have authority in this area? And is it convicting rather than condemning? Now let's look at the last filter. Number seven, do I sense God's peace about it? Let me stop here a second. Do I sense God's peace about it? (sighs) A lot of times, a lot of times, this is the only filter we use. A lot of times, we blow off the other six and jump straight to this. Do I sense God's peace? Well, I feel good about this. I, I'm really at peace with this. I'm, I'm calm about this. It's got to be from God. The truth is, it's only one of the filters. If the other six don't line up, it ain't from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Here's the deal. If you feel pressured to make a life decision very quickly, it ain't from God. It ain't. How many of you guys are parents? Got kids. Well, if you're parents, you got kids, right? (laughs) Okay. You got kids, right? (sighs) Do you want your kids stressed out? Do you want them making decisions, life-affecting decisions under pressure? No. We none of us do. As loving parents, we want our kids to be in what they feel like is a loving, safe environment where they can grow and they can mature and they can make meaningful, right, logical, appropriate decisions for their lives. Do you understand God wants that too? He wants that for you and me. Nowhere in the Bible does it say hurry and rush into a decision. Nowhere in the Bible does it say hurry and do this. Because you see, Hurrying and rushing into something isn't scriptural. In fact, the word patient or patience is found over 50 times in scripture. If you stop and think about it, 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 it's one of the fruits of the spirit. It's also one of the descriptions of Jesus himself. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is big, guys. Listen to me. Satan drives us compulsively. And the Holy Spirit moves us gently. So when God speaks and you say yes to what he's asking, there's a peace, there's a calmness, There's an assurance. There's a gentleness there. Even if there's a storm raging all around you, it's there. There, There's this deep sense of peace because you've heard from God and you've responded to what he's asking you to do. And I got to say, just the opposite is true when Satan speaks. There's confusion. 
there's unrest, there's turmoil. So to review, does it, does it line up with Scripture? Does it, does it agree with the Bible? Does it help me become more like Jesus? Does my church family and other believers confirm this thing? Is it consistent with the way that God made me? Do I have authority in this area? Is it any of my business? Is it convicting rather than condemning? And finally, is there a peace about the decision? Now, guys, I encourage you to take this outline and put it somewhere where you can refer to it. I got to tell you, this, this teaching and the use of this teaching has changed my life. When, when Dawn and I felt God calling us to plant this church, the first thing we did was take that feeling, that decision, and run it through these seven filters. And as we asked people to come on board and be a part of what we were doing, the first thing we asked each one of them to do is walk through the seven filters with this and see if it is what God's calling you to do. And I got to tell you, even when it passes all seven filters, sometimes it feels impossible. Sometimes it seems ridiculous or ludicrous. I mean, when God called Dawn and I to plant the church, that seemed so stupid. It seemed impossible. He's calling a 60-year-old dude to plant a church? It didn't make sense at all. But when we ran it through the seven filters and we realized we are hearing for God from God and the folks we asked to come alongside of us said they were hearing from God, we jumped in head first. It was scary. It was frightening. But today we are a dynamic, active, alive church accomplishing more than Dawn or I ever dared to dream or imagine. Now, I know some of you are thinking, I don't know about all this stuff, Pastor Steve. I have never heard from God. I don't care what you say. I've never gotten a thought from God. I've never gotten an idea. I certainly hadn't heard a voice. Even reading his word, I get nothing. There's a hard truth I want you to hear, if that's you. It's not in your outline. It's not on the PowerPoint, so don't freak out. But don't believe me either. Go home and look it up for yourself. John 8, 47. Here's what it says. Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. But you know what? If that's you, you can fix that. If that's you, you can change that. All it takes is establishing a relationship with Jesus. And that's not hard because he did all the heavy lifting. All you have to do is ask him to come into your life. Admit that you're a sinner. I mean, suck it up. We all are. Admit that you are. And tell him that you believe with all the faith you can muster that he died for you. And ask him to be a part of your life. That's all you got to do. And if you do, he will. And I guarantee you, you'll hear from him. It might not be an audible voice, but the next time you read his word, you're going to hear him. And the thoughts you're going to start getting are thoughts that he's giving you. But don't trust just that. Don't trust me saying that. Take those thoughts, take those ideas, and walk through these seven filters. If you do, I can pretty much guarantee you You've heard from God. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this teaching. Thank you for helping all of us filter out that which is not important so that we can hear from you that which is important. Father, my prayer this morning for everybody here is that they will begin to use these simple seven filters and then respond to you and do what you've called us to do. Accomplish the purpose that you put us on this planet to accomplish. 
Father, I thank you for this teaching. I thank you that this is one of those things that we can use every single day. It is literally a practical application of a theological principle. Thank you for that. You're an amazing God. We love you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.